gathered on As your people come and stand by me Ya, 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 ya lo prendí, ya. Sí, también, también a, aprendo rápido. ¿De quién es esto? Ah, ok, bueno. Días, buenos, 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 sí. Muy buenos. la batería porque se apaga, ¿eh? Bueno. Ahora sí, ya está. Bueno, pues muy buenos días a todos. Muchísimas gracias por su presencia. Este, hoy, 31 de julio, pues vamos a empezar la serie de, de conferencias que hemos venido teniendo con bastante éxito durante pues, los últimos seis años y ahora está el séptimo, el séptimo, la séptima ciclo que de conferencias sobre el panorama actual. En particular, este eh, día, bueno, esta, este, este ciclo está dedicado a pues, un tema muy, eh, muy de moda y no nomás de moda, sino importante para la humanidad, que es el cambio climático. Nada más le voy a leer algo, una intro, cosa introductoria, ¿no? El cambio climático como una amenaza global. En los últimos años, el cambio climático se ha perfilado como la principal amenaza global a la que se enfrenta la humanidad. Sus manifestaciones iniciales, detectadas ya de manera inequívoca, se expresan como alteraciones en la variabilidad del clima, anomalías en la temperatura y la estacionalidad de muchos procesos, progresiva elevación de, del nivel del mar, acidificación de los océanos, intensificación de la actividad ciclónica, incidencia anormal de fenómenos hidrometeorológicos y extremos, etcétera, lo cual tiene sus efectos crecientes en la salud pública, la infraestructura, los procesos productivos, entre otros aspectos que inciden de manera decisiva en el desarrollo de nuestra sociedad. En el ámbito natural, el cambio climático conlleva a una progresiva transformación en los ecosistemas y un deterioro potencialmente irreversible en su biodiversidad, como consecuencia con consecuencias tan severas como impredecibles. De mantenerse las tendencias actuales, este proceso global podría llegar a comprometer los sistemas de soporte de la vida del planeta y las perspectivas de supervivencia de una buena parte de las especies que lo habitan, incluyendo la nuestra. El proceso que determina en la actualidad el cambio climático se origina a partir de la actividad humana por el aumento de las emisiones a la atmósfera de gases y compuestos de efecto invernadero. Estas emisiones, al rebasar la capacidad de los humedos terrestres y marinos, conducen a mayores concentraciones de estos gases en la atmósfera. Desde el punto de vista observacional, el aumento de dióxido de carbono en la atmósfera se correlaciona con las emisiones determinadas por las actividades productivas y demás procesos socioeconómicos. La concentración promedio de dióxido de carbono, principal gas de efecto invernadero, se mantenía muy estable en torno a los 280 partes por millón en la era preindustrial. Alcanzó un nivel máximo de 407 eh, ppm por, en el mes de mayo del 2016. Los niveles actuales de concentración del CO2 carecen de precedente al menos en los últimos 400 mil años y por la larga permanencia de este y de, gases de, de, de otros gases de efecto invernadero en la atmósfera, representa una pesada hipoteca para las generaciones futuras. Enfrentar el cambio climático antes de que, de que este proceso nos lleve a situaciones irreversibles y de gran riesgo, constituye una necesidad apremiante para todos los países. 
Su atención es cada vez más urgente y requiere una transformación radical en los modelos de desarrollo de los países. El Acuerdo de París, el Acuerdo de París incorpora el objetivo de mantener el aumento de la temperatura mundial por debajo de los 2 grados centígrados con respecto a los niveles preindustriales y proseguir los esfuerzos para limitar este aumento de la temperatura de 1.5 grados. Esperamos que esto se logre por el bien de las generaciones futuras. Bueno, pues durante estos dos, estas siguientes dos semanas tenemos el séptimo ciclo de conferencias sobre el estado del arte de ciencias atmosféricas. En particular, como les había comentado, el tema principal es el cambio climático. Hemos invitado a 10 científicos reconocidos en el estudio de la atmósfera para darnos un panorama actual y vamos a te, eh, tener pláticas muy interesantes. Los científicos eh, que han sido invitados vienen de Francia, Estados Unidos, Reino Unido y Holanda. Entonces, lo que vamos a oír en estos 10 eh, días, eh, temas como que van a, o que tienen que ver con el papel que tienen los organismos en los procesos atmosféricos, como en la formación de nubes, el clima en zonas tropicales, el monzón de Norteamérica, contaminación atmosférica en, ciudad, en ciudades, la química de la atmósfera en el siglo XXI y su relación con el cambio climático, así como monitoreo de gases de efecto invernadero, la relación entre las, eh, también la relación entre las ciencias sociales y el cambio climático, además de los costos que este fenómeno tiene en la economía de los países. Este es un esfuerzo de, de a los académicos, del Centro de Ciencias de la Atmósfera, de la Administración del Centro y además de la Coordinación de la Investigación Científica de la UNAM, que nos ha dado todo su apoyo. Por último, quiero hacer una invitación muy especial a todos los estudiantes interesados en el estudio de la atmósfera y en el cuidado del ambiente para que asistan a, nuestro, a este ciclo. Está sumamente dirigido, principalmente, perdón, dirigido a los estudiantes porque son la, 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 la generación futura y espero que muchos de ustedes que están estudiando las maestrías o el doctorado alrededor de estos temas, próximamente se puedan integrar a equipos de trabajo en el Centro de Ciencias de la Hermosa. Pues sin más, doy la bienvenida a todos ustedes, a los invitados especiales y pues empezaríamos con la plática de la doctora Anne-Marie. De Lord, así se pronuncia, de Lord, ok, que aquí está presente. Y la prese, como hemos hecho, es que los, los académicos que tuvieron, que hicieron el esfuerzo por invitar a los diferentes conferentistas, este, van a presentar, hacen la semblanza y posteriormente, una vez terminada la, la conferencia, el doctor Canek será la, perso la, el, la persona que actuará con, para moderar las, las, las sesiones. Bueno, faltan 10 minutos, no sé si empecemos, no, mejor esperamos porque era a las 12 del día, ¿no? Creo que para la inauguración siempre es demasiado tiempo, que creo que como 15, no sé, este, 15 minutos o 10 o así, bueno, pero en fin, les, les pediría si esperamos 10 minutitos porque pues está citada en… Eh, en todos los medios que, este, que de la universidad este, que, se, que se hicieron, fueron a las 12 del día. Muchísimas gracias.
Buenos días. Bueno, buenas, ya son tardes, creo, así que buenas tardes para todos. Al igual que la doctora Telma, quiero expresar eh, pues una bienvenida a este séptimo panorama de, actual de las ciencias atmosféricas y pues es un placer para mí introducir a nuestra primera invitada, que es la que va a abrir esta serie de 10 presentaciones. Mm, pero antes de esto, pues le agradezco a todos ustedes y los que nos están siguiendo en línea eh, por hacer parte de este evento y espero que nos sigan no solo hoy, sino los otros nueve días restantes. ¿no? Eh, So I would like to thank also Anne-Marie for being here. So it's a real pleasure that you came from France to, to share with us what you have been doing in the last 10, 20 years, whatever. So thank you for being here, and it's a real honor that you accepted the invitation. Uh, I'm going to introduce you in Spanish, if you don't mind. Um, eh, quiero aclarar que esta, eh, nuestra invitada del día de hoy es una invitada como en conjunto de la doctora Irma Rosas, así que es una invitada que viene del grupo de aerobiología, al igual que del grupo de interacción micro y mesoescala. ¿Y por qué se da esta razón? Pues bueno, aquí en, en el CCA tenemos dos grupos que de una u otra manera trabajamos con nubes y hay también otros dos grupos que trabajan con biopartículas. Y entonces lo que ha sabido hacer la doctora Anne Marie es como combinar estos dos componentes atmosféricos que son de, su, de suma importancia para la atmósfera y pues ella es una de las pioneras justamente en ver cómo estos microorganismos que están en la atmósfera pueden afectar las nubes, pueden afectar la química y la física de la atmósfera. Entonces la doctora Anne Marie eh, nos acompaña desde el Instituto de Química de Clemoferrand, que está ubicado en Clemoferrand, en Francia. Eh, ella trabaja temas como la biología, la química molecular la metabolómica y la microbiología, ¿no? entonces el día de hoy ella nos va a intentar compartir un poco esto para que todos entendamos la importancia de estos microorganismos dentro de las nubes. Como les decía anteriormente, ella es una de las pioneras en este estudio y ha logrado publicar alrededor de 135 artículos con más de 3.000 citas, así que su trabajo pues tiene un gran impacto en nuestra comunidad. Entonces sin más preámbulo, pues quiero agradecer a la doctora Anne Marie y por favor, adelante. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, Luis, for this very nice presentation. Because I can follow Spanish, I cannot speak it, but I can understand it. And uh, it's a really a great pleasure to be here. It's my first time in Mexico. And it's a great place for studying atmosphere. And uh, OK, uh, as Luis said, uh, this is a, a kind of new topic. Not so new, because we started about 10 years ago, 15 years ago but it is mixing microbiology and atmospheric sciences, so it's a bit unusual. So, uh, first of all, maybe you wonder where do this, oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, microorganisms that we find in the atmosphere, and especially in clouds, because we are working in clouds, of course they, they come from the Earth, so they are not uh, as a kind of magic thing. <laughs> they are going for a circle, so they are emitted from the water, from the soil and from the vegetation, and it's quite important. Vegetation, I will use the word philosphere. It's the place where the bacteria live on the leaves of the, of the different uh, uh, trees and plants and so on. So they come into the air because they are aerosolized from different mechanisms. The main one is the wind, of course. It will take the, the particles out of the soil, out of the, the trees but also by bubbling mechanisms. So, for instance, you know, everybody knows if you go to the ocean, there are uh, uh, vaporization uh, bubbling uh, out of the water into the air, and then it comes into the, the dry air. And then there will be particles in the air, they will be um, dispersing, so in both direction, in vertical, but also horizontal direction. And finally, um, they will, it takes a long time to, Okay, they will become a cloud because as any particle of a small size, people of the atmosphere call that CCN, they will condense water at their surface and so they will become a droplet. So they will become into the cloud because they are themselves droplets. And then they will go down to the soil, uh, mainly by wet deposition, so by precipitation, rain, snow, and so on. Sometimes they can also go down by dry deposition, but for bacteria which are rather small, it's rather the wet deposition which is the main important. So we've been uh, working on different topics, but today I will, I will focus on three main topics. The first one is how they help to make the 
droplets. Do they have an influence in the formation of droplets? Then when they are in, the, in these clouds, do they play a role in cloud chemistry? Are they an alternative to the photochemistry, for instance? And finally, some of these microbes, some of them, not all of them, they can produce ice. And then they can help to the precipitation, because um, somebody of you know, before having rain, you have ice. And so they can make ice and maybe help to precipitate. OK, now what are these microbes? So we study microbes in the clouds because we are lucky to live in Clermont-Ferrand, which is close to this mountain, which is called the Puy de Dome. So the Puy de Dome is a volcano. It's 1,465 meters high. It is in the center of France. You have France here, Spain, England. And it's often governed with clouds. And on the top of the Puy de Dome, there is an observatory, which is very well known. And now it is labeled as a global atmospheric watch site. So it means it's one of the 30 sites all over the world that's watching the quality of the atmosphere. So there it is uh, a nice place where you have um, the observatory here, which is fully equipped for, of course, meteorology and looking at all the parameters as you have here on top of the roof. But also there is um, a laboratory for chemistry and also a laboratory for microbiology, as you can see here. And uh, in addition to that, of course, we, we have uh, on the roof, we have cloud collectors where we can collect cloud. And so we are working on the cloud water that we collect on top of this uh, station. And for people who are not uh, very familiar with that, this is a, a droplet impactor. So the, the principle is quite easy. So you, have, you put the, your cloud impactor facing the wind and then the, if it is in the cloud. So it means the cloud has to be on top of the mountain. And then you have an aspirator that uh, make aspiration here. And you have a, a design, specific design here. We have a slit which is designed in such a way that cloud water will go through this site and the air will go around. So the air will be flushed out. And so we collect the cloud water. And then we can study this cloud water. Of course, we have to work under sterile condition because we are working with microbiology. So we work, I can go back to the other maybe here. You can see a picture of, of Muriel. You know him, <laughs> Louis. Uh, so you have a gloves, you have masks, and you are equipped to be, everything has to be sterile, of course, to, to not contaminate the sample. OK, and then what kind of bacteria we, we get? If we look at the numbers, so we have been a survey for 15 years now, and this paper was corresponding to 10 years survey. Uh, you have very little number. Uh, to 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 cells per mil of bacteria. If you make a comparison, you have the same in, in uh, water that you drink. Drinkable water is the same, so it means it's rather pure. There are not so many bacteria, but still, and there are some spores and, and some yeast, and you see it's one or the lower, because they are bigger anyway, so they are in the same range. Now, what kind of bacteria? So, for a long time, we have been studying only the culturable bacteria. So, I mean, we cl collect the cloud water, we put the cloud water on pretty dishes, and then you culture them, you isolate them, you sequence them, and then you know what type of bacteria you have. And so f this is the result for 10 years. Basically, concerning the bacteria, you have main genera, which are, sorry, uh, which are Pseudomonas. They belong to gamma proteobacteria and Sphemgomonas, which belong to alpha proteobacteria. But you see there are many, many kinds of bacteria. You can find all types of bacteria that live on Earth. And so we are collecting these bacteria, and now we have a, a big collection of them. So we have about 1,000 strains in the lab in our collection, and this is very useful when we want to do experiment in the lab. We can use these bacteria, and as model of what exists in the cloud. Now the story. So that was to to describe the the, the microorganism. But the big question for us, because we are interested in the processes, how they can behave, uh, what they can do in the cloud. It was this first experiment that gave us a, a very um, first idea. If you grow the cell, it to the, you take the cloud media, you do nothing, you put it at 70 degrees. 70 degrees is average temperature in the, in the summertime at the Puy Dome. 
and you leave them. And what you can see is they are growing. So the ATP is, is um, going up and the number of cells is going up. It means you do nothing and these cells, they grow. So they are able, it means they are alive. And they are able to use substrates, so molecules which are present in the cloud water, and they can use it to survive and to, to divide. So that was the first mm -hmm. experiment, very basic, that gave us the idea to say, okay, but if they are alive, then they, they can do things in the atmosphere, and they can use compounds which are in the atmosphere. It can, and so maybe they can play a role in atmospheric chemistry, for instance. So now we have confirmation of this activity in clouds, thanks to more recent approach, which is um, uh, the, the, the analysis of the DNA and the RNA in the clouds. So maybe it's complicated for people who are not biologists, but before we were studying uh, bacteria and fungi that were growing on a specific substrate, okay, but this represents only what percent of the all microorganism. Now we can use metagenomics or metatranscriptonics analysis. It means you take the cloud water, you extract everything which is inside, all the DNA, all the RNA, and you analyze it. You sequence it, and then you analyze. And what you can see, I'm not going to into detail, but just to remind you what I said before, the main uh, groups which are there are again proteobacteria. And these are the bacteria we were finding by culture. So they are the same which are very important in clouds when you look at all the bacteria present or only the one that you can culture. But more important, you can see that that time they are really alive in, in clouds because if you look at the RNA, it means if they produce RNA, messenger RNA, it means they are active. And what again, again you can see they are active, all of them, and in particular these proteobacteria are active. So it means that this is the, the first proof that on site, directly in the cloud, because what you take is the, the cloud water, you fix it, and if there is mRNA, it means they are alive, they are still synthesizing RNA. So that's the proof that it is true directly in the clouds. Before it was in the lab, this is in the cloud, and this is the first experiment that shows it. And we are really happy about this result because, because proteobacteria are the main one and the main active, then we can use our <coughs> model strains, the one that we are isolated, the pseudomonas, and that you can use it every day because they are good models. Before, we didn't know it was really good models or not. So, role in micro, the, of this microorganism in cloud chemistry. So, as you have shown before, they are active. It, active, it means they have a metabolism. Metabolism means you have enzymes, they are active enzymes, and enzymes are nothing else but biocatalysis. So they can catalyze reactions. And then if you look, for instance, we have, sorry, what we have shown here, I will show you two examples. One is to look at the transformation of the organic matter, so all these com carbon compounds which are present in cloud water. And the second one in the direction of oxidants. Oxidants are very important in the chemistry of clouds because they are sources of radicals. So they are the basics of the cloud chemistry. And so uh, just to remind you uh, the basic things about cloud chemistry. So uh, here you have a droplet, then you have the CCN, then you have the, the air around, the gas phase. So there are lots of different reactions taking place. One is, of, first of all, is the mass transfer, okay? Because <coughs> some reactions are active in the, in the gas phase and then they can be transferred here. Of course, radical chemistry and particular photochemistry, which is active in the gas, in the liquid phase, but also in the interface. Then the CCN, if you have, for instance, iron or nitrous, it can dissolve in, in the water phase. Then, of course, you have physical uh, problems like precipitation or evaporation but there is a big reactivity inside the, the droplet. And to be very simple and basic, you have organic matter, so lots and lots of organic compounds in, as a mixture, and you have radicals. And the main radicals in cloud chemistry are OH, which is the major one, in particular during the daytime, and nitrate radical. And you have these oxidant species, like in particular hydrogen peroxide and iron that are the source of radicals. So of course, all this is uh, cloud chemistry, but the question was then, do these microbes, because they are active, they have uh, biocatalyzer, can they compete with this radical chemistry? So the main question we tried to answer. So just to give you an example of, of cloud chemistry, again, a basic, a basic one, 
uh, well, a lot of things happen in the cloud, outside, and there are lots of, the basic thing is you have oxidation to smaller and smaller molecules. At the end, you have, for instance, formic acid, form formaldehyde, formic acid, CO2, just for oxidation pathways. So I take your attention about oxalic acid, formic acid, acetic acid, formaldehyde, for instance. And these compounds, if you are a biologist, they are typically compounds that are part of the metabolism of microbes. So they are typically using these compounds as, as a metabolite, as substrate. You do the same, actually. You can use formic acid, acetic acid, acetic acid. If you have lemon, then you eat acetic acid and you transform it. So we do the same. For instance, here you have the, what we call the C1 metabolism in bacteria. It's a me specific metabolism that takes C1 compound like methanol, here, formaldehyde, formate CO2. And there are also other, other metabolisms which are more complex. But just to say you that there is also the same type of uh, oxidation that happens with uh, radical chemistry. So the idea was to compare the two. Another big thing is the, the oxidation in the clouds. I have problem to put that. So as I tell you before, hydrogen peroxide and iron are very important in cloud chemistry. I'm not going into detail in all these reactions, which are very complex, but the result is a formation of, of OH radicals, which are very, very reactive, and that transform most of the organic matter. And you see these compounds. If you imagine that the bacteria are within this, uh, this uh, system, they face a lot of uh, radicals, a lot of hydrogen peroxide, a lot of oxidant. You have also um, superoxide, uh, oxygen superoxide ion. These are supposed to be very stressful for the, the, the microorganism. But if you look from a closer site, again, they are used to this uh, oxidative stress. I mean, any cell, including you, when you breathe oxygen, you are going to produce reactive oxygen uh, species. For instance, here you have uh, the cytomastic membrane. So this is inside the cell, this is outside. When you breathe oxygen, this is what you do now, you are going to produce ROS. So it, you, are using, you are going to produce OH radical, superoxide uh, radicals, and H2O2. And what happens in your cells, you have a lot, hopefully, if you don't have these things, then you go to the cell death. You're going to, to make, destroy things for the proteins, for the DNA, and, and so on. But hopefully, we have something to protect us, which is called oxidative stress. And then there are different molecules that will stop these radicals. So for instance, vitamins, pigments in the membranes, there are lots of these bacteria, they are red, orange, red, and they are pigments that stop these radicals. And also you have enzymes, enzymes that will transform, for instance, superoxide radical, which is very, um, very uh, stressful. By this superoxide dismutase, which is an enzyme, it will produce H2O2. And H2O2 will be transformed at another enzyme to oxygen and water. This is okay for the cell. So as you can see here, we are, the, the cells are ready to face this oxidative environment. And what happens with uh, clouds? You have iron, you have uh, hydrogen peroxide, you have the, the light here, and you are going to produce the same type of errors that will transfer inside the cell, but bacteria, they are used to that. So they are going to face that and to transform these molecules. So you can see from one side, on the carbon side, we have enzyme equipment to transform the, this organic matter. And on the other side, from the oxidative stress, we have also enzymes and different molecules that can face this, the presence of uh, oxidative uh, component. So that was the idea we wanted to, uh, to prove that it, it could be the case with bacteria from the clouds. And we did a lot of experiments uh, concerning cloud chemistry and carbon metabolism. But I will show you just one example. Uh, this one was done with real cloud samples, so I mean not bacteria isolated, but just the cloud sample we, we took at the Pudum station. There we were chemical uh, mixture, very complex, and all the biodiversity of the microorganisms. We didn't isolate, there were many thousands of different cells in the cloud. And then we, um, so this cloud, we choose three different clouds, so the Pudum is here, okay? And here you have back trajectory showing the, the cloud origin. And we are 
lucky in Clermont because this super site is considered as a good model to study the, the anthropization of the cloud because if you come, the cloud comes from the ocean, for instance, it will be rather unpolluted cloud from the ocean. If it comes from that direction, it will be highly polluted because it goes through different big towns and big regions of industry. And it can come also from the, from the south. It's not very often that it comes from the south. It is in an intermediate situation. So we took three different clouds that makes a variety of the different clouds we can collect at the dome station. And then we designed this type of experiment. How to compare the mechanism which are biotic, so due to the microorganism, and due to the sun or to the radical chemistry. So that was easy. We took a cloud sample, so cloud water sample, and then we divided in two parts. One, we sterilized uh, this, uh, this cloud sample. We, we went through a filter, so there is no more microorganism. So there are only abiotic uh, reactions, chemi chemical reaction. One is in the dark, and one is in the sun. So we use a photobioreactor where you can mimic the sun, which is in the light, in the, in the, um, in the, the cloud. And you, you have the temperature at which the, the, I'm sorry, the temperature is fitted to one uh, of the, the cloud we collected. And on the other hand, you have the intact cloud. So there are still all the microbes present here. One is in the dark. So this will reveal the impact of the microbes specifically while this one is exposed to solar sun. So that in that case, you have both the bacteria and the sun. And for that, we have monitored different organic acid compounds uh, and also um, hydrogen peroxide. And the result, I'll get, just give you the result, is, is this one. We have measured the rates of transformation of different compounds. So for instance, oxalic acid, formaldehyde, myelonate, succinate, acetate, formate. These are the main compounds you can find in cloud water. And in red, you have what is produced or degraded. This is degraded by photochemistry. This is produced by photochemistry. And the, the blue ones are due to microbial activity. So you can see here, except for oxalate, where microbes, they don't like oxalate. They never degrade it. For the rest, they can easily degrade it. And it means we are in the same range of order. I don't say that microbes are better than photochemistry, but they are the same range of order considering the rates. So it means, OK, we knew that the enzymes were present, OK. But in this type of experiment, we show that they are in the same range of order. So it means it has an interest to look at them, because they can really have an impact. Because if they are active, but only for 0.01% of the activity, then forget it. But from the lab experiment, with a real cloud, with everything uh, non-cultured, just like that, it has an impact. So that was the first result. The second one was looking at uh, hydrogen peroxide degradation. As I remind you here, it is the main source of uh, OH radicals. And again, we have made the same experiment. And here, this is the result during the daytime and nighttime. During the t daytime, it means when you have the light on, uh, of course, the, the major part is due to the OH radical activity. You can see here. But still, there is some microorganism activity, which is not zero. And of course, during the night time, you have OH radicals are much lower. You still have nitrogen, uh, nitrate radicals, and you have also all the phantom, photophantom, and so on reactions. And in that case, they are dominating. So again, we are in the same range of activity. So it means that they are competing with the transformation of hydrogen peroxide by the light or by the microbes. So this interaction between hyd uh, hydrogen peroxide and microorganism was really something new that nobody really thought about it. So we decided to go deeper uh, in understanding what was happening. And here, you, again, you have the scheme of the, the formation of all the, the radicals and so on with the iron, nitrate. And so we look at the interaction between microorganism and hydrogen peroxide, as we did on, the, on this cloud sample. But this time, we're going to work with isolate bacteria. And then, because we know it is a stress, we are looking also at the interaction between 
this molecule and the mechanism, the metabolism of this macronism. So we designed an experiment in the lab. This time we used um, microbes that we knew, and we described what we call a microcosm mimicking cloud water condition. So we have used artificial, sorry, I go away. Artificial cloud solution. So we have in the lab now a solution that mimics uh, marine composition of the clouds, that we, which are the most often found at the Pudum station. Then we have used bacterial strain isolated from clouds, which are uh, refer selected as reference strains. There are mainly the pseudomonas, as we have seen, they are the most important. Then we have to do the model of, of iron complex to, in fact, uh, produce these radicals. And we have used artificial solar light that mimic what the light which is in clouds. And so we did uh, uh, this type of experiment, as before, in these photobioreactors, but with model strains, so Pseudomonas strain and Sphagodomonas. Remember, they are the two main species we can find. And we did a lot of different experiments <coughs> with, or no, sorry, with or without light, with or without hydrogen peroxide, with or without iron uh, complex, and so on. And these are the results. We follow the degradation of uh, H2O2. And what you can see here is we look at the um, abiotic conditions. In all cases, uh, they are, in the two first cases, they are not so important. You need really hydrogen, uh, iron and hydrogen per peroxide to produce um, OH radicals. So OK, if this was expected, you have degradation of H2O2 by uh, the light and iron. But here, you again, you have the H2O2 with the bacteria in different conditions, and you can see it's much more efficient in that case. So uh, it means that, as we showed it before in the bulk uh, cloud water, we, f we found the same with isolates from the clouds, different strains, and we got the same type of result. They are able to transform H2O2. So that was a confirmation of what you've seen before. And when you measure the rates of degradation, they are the same range of, of magnitude as the rates we measure in the, in the bulk cloud water. Then the thing that was interesting, what H2O2 makes on the bacteria. And to assess that, we measure ATP. So I don't know if you know that. It's uh, adenosine triphosphate. It's a key molecule of the metabolism of the cell. So all cells produce ATP, the kind of energy of the cell. So it's a, a proxy for all the metabolism of the cell. So when you have a large amount of ATP, you are in a good health. You have a low amount, you are in a bad health, if I can express that. So we look at the ATP concentration of the cells uh, with and without the presence of hydrogen peroxide. So here, it's without hydrogen peroxide. As you see, it doesn't decrease. It even decreases with time. But in the presence of hydrogen peroxide, then it suddenly drops down from 15 to 5 picomolar, <coughs> and then it recovers. And then if you look carefully at the time scale, when does it recover? It recovers when uh, you have completely degraded H2O2. It means that during the time they are degrading H2O2, the ATP drops down. And then when it's finished, they go up again. So we look at this. Uh, these different uh, time uh, sampling to see what happens to the cell. When they it drops down, does it mean they are dying? So we are looking at the cell number. So this shows that it has a strong impact on the metabolism of the cell. But if you look at the number of cells, so what you take at each time scale, you, you sample the, your, your bacteria, you put them on a petri dish like this, and you count the number of cells. One cell will give one colony. So it will give you the number of cells during the time. And what you can see is if they are growing with and without, it is the same. So they are not dying. They are surviving to this uh, pressure of H2O2. They behave normally when you look at the growth curves. So it means that they are facing this stress, and they are even growing. And finally, it means that they are modulating their metabolome. What we call the metabolome is all the metabolic pathway which are many in the cell, they are reorganizing all the metabolic pathways. They are adapting to the thing, so the metabolism is different, but they are not dying. And when it's finished, then they recover, and the ATP rise again. So they survive, and they adapt to the concentration of H2O2. 
Okay, so this maybe I'm not going into detail because maybe it's a bit complex, I don't know. For microbiologists in the, in the audience, what happens really? So first of all, you can see that H2O2 is degrading in, in H2. We have seen that from catalase. And then uh, what does H2O2 as a stress? It will block the ATP centers. So the enzyme that produces ATP, this is why ATP is, is uh, decreasing. It's his work is acting on glutathion. Glutathion is a um, sulfur metabolite that will uh, be oxidized or reduced, and so will pump the, the will uh, maintain the oxidative uh, and reduction uh, equilibrium. And then what it does, it also acts on the DNA repair system. As I, I explained, when you have radicals, it will act on DNA. DNA, it's very important to be repaired, otherwise you're going to die. And the enzymes, the system of repair, of, uh, that repair the DNA, is linked to NAD. And it will deplete this N NAD, so maybe it's too complex, I don't know. In the end, it means that all these systems are impacting NAD, and NAD, and NADH is a cofactor which is always linked to ATP. So we, every time you modify this oxidoreduction uh, equilibrium, then you modify the ATP content. And this is why we see the ATP content which is decreasing because they are repairing the DNA, they are uh, combating the OH by glutathione. They, they, they do a lot of things to, to stop the stress. And for that, as a consequence, it changes the ATP content. And then when it's finished, they come back. Okay, this was in the lab, but we tried to see if this could be the strong uh, link between ATP and H2O2. This is what we saw in the lab. But is it true in the clouds? How to assess that? We cannot <laughs> go into the cloud to see it. But what we have done it is we have done statistics. We have collected, we had in the lab 70 clouds that we collected. And from the clouds, we had different chemical um, parameters, microbiological parameters. And so we could make some statistics. For instance, some uh, AC PCA uh, statistic here. So to understand that, we have to, to look at the different parameters. So these are different compounds we measure in clouds, like ammonia, sulfate, nitrate, sodium, potassium, we measure. Uh, we measure the pH, uh, we measure ATP, uh, and so on. The number of cells, the bacteria, the fungi, the temperature, all of the parameters that we measure in the seven, three se um, 37 clouds events. But when you look at the correlation, what is highly correlated is ATP and H2O2. So this is also true if you take the, the sample that are directly on the clouds, not in the lab. And uh, interestingly, uh, you can see that this correlation is true here. And ATP is not linked to the pH, for instance, or the temperature on the mother cell. It's really linked to H2O2. We made another type of um, uh, statistical um, analysis, univariate versus time, and then we found a correlation factor which is extremely low. It means that the, the, the correlation is really high. So it looks like in the clouds, uh, they can adapt to this H2O2 concentration and the ATP also varies depending on the cloud conditions. So what is, uh, what do you think uh, on the, what, what is the importance for atmospheric chemistry? So if we look at the transformation of organic matter, we know that radical chemistry plays a major role. This is known for ages. But cloud mechanism, we have seen that thanks to the catalase and peroxidases, they can act on H2O2. So they can act on the source of these radicals. On the other hand, we have seen that this H2O2 act on the cloud uh, metabolism and they deplete the ATP concentration. And finally, cloud macronism, they act on organic matter directly thanks to the carbon metabolism. And then, I'm not going to present the results here, but we've done what we call metabolomics approach. So instead of looking just at ATP, you are looking at all the metabolic routes that ex exist in the, in, the, in the cells, and you can see what is modified in the presence of H2O2. And what we have seen is it's, uh, what uh, is modified is carbohydrates, carboxylic acid, lipids, amino acids. And this is quite important. Why? Because Carboxylic acid, we know they are important in clouds. 
Uh, carboy bright, we know they are, on, uh, they are also present in clouds. Amino acid, that was recently shown, they represent a high amount of compounds in clouds. So it means that depending on H2O2, which is varying a lot with the day and night, with the season, with the pollution, you will have a modulation of this system. So on, on this side and on this side, it's kind of cycle, and it makes the thing very complex. It means that there is strong interaction between the, the carbon metabolism, the oxidative stress metabolism, and radical chemistry. So that was the end of the first time of my talk, which was focused on cloud chemistry. Now we move to microphysics. So microphysics, I will uh, say a few things about the droplet formation and precipitation. So droplet for formation, so there are physicists in the, in the, in the audience, so you know that droplets, they form, they are small, and then they grow. And there are some compounds that can be packed at the surface. And recently, it has been shown that, or there is a great hypothesis, that if you have uh, surface-active compounds, so surface-active, for people who are not familiar, you will say uh, surfactants, uh, that will go to this interface, so they will go here, at the interface between the droplets and the air, it may change the formation of this cloud droplet. So it will change uh, the growth of the aerosol particle and increase the CCN formation. So that's a, a recent, recent paper that has shown that. And so uh, the idea here was to look at biosurfactant because surfactants can be also produced by microorganisms. They are surface active agents. They are produced by microbes as secondary metabol metabolism and they are very, very diverse. There are many kinds of structure, but there are um, some specificities. They are always formed from a hydrophilic head, which is, for instance, a sugar. In that case, you have glycolipids or a peptide. And they have a hydrophobic tail, which is always a long uh, lipids. Okay? So you have glycolipids, lipopeptides, and also polymeric surfactants, which are a long chain of sugars. And these uh, biosurfactants are extremely active. Compared to, uh, for instance, surfactants you can buy in a, in a that are produced by a chemical industry, they are two orders of magnitude higher when you consider the, the activity. So the idea was to test, to screen our strains that are in, in the lab from different cloud <coughs> events and to see how many of them could produce biosurfactants. So these are the, the bacteria we, s we have tested here. So they are mainly form of proteobacteria. As I said before, they are the major groups present in our collections. And these are from the phyllosphere. Remember, they are mainly found on the, on the leaves of grass, of uh, trees, and so on. There are some yeast, basidomycota, and actinobacteria are also really highly present. So we have tested all these cloud uh, sample, cloud isolate to see if they are able to produce biosurfactants. So how do we proceed? We are going to measure directly the surface tension uh, with this uh, apparatus. Maybe you know it. So what is the principle? You grow the cell, uh, then you collect the supernatant, so it's just the culture medium, and then you measure surface tension. So you, you put... No, no, no. You put your medium in this needle here, and this needle will, will form a droplet, which is around 10 micron. So this is why it's called also a hanging, hanging droplet method. You have this droplet here, and here you have a system with a camera, which is filming every second or less, the shape of the, the droplets, how it will evolve with time. And at the beginning, your droplet is uh, spherical. And if you just have water, it will, it will stay like that. But if you have a um, surface active uh, product, like a biosurfactant, with time the droplet will change the shape and at the end it will drop down. And if you measure, if you measure the, the, the size here of the, and the shape of the droplet, then you can recover and you can measure, you can calculate the surface tension of your, of your um, solution. And so you can get this kind of curve. So surface tension, for instance, of water will be constant and will be always uh, at that value. 
So they are measured as millinewton per meter. Then if you have the, just the culture medium of the cell, then it will vary a little bit because it's not pure water, but you can see it's sta quite stable. And then when you have bacteria, if they are producing uh, these surfactants, <coughs> this surface tension <coughs> will really decrease from 70 down to 30 sometimes. And the kinetic is depending on the, on the different uh, strains because there is first uh, an equilibrium that takes place. Basically, the different molecules go to the interface and they, they form, uh, they go at the interface between the water and the, the air. So it takes some time, as you can see, it uh, takes uh, quite a, a long time, actually. Um, and then uh, the, the, the final equilibrium takes place. And so the final measurement of the surface tanker tension is taken here. Some go very quickly, some go very slowly. But in the end, they can have the same surface tension. And so you can then uh, have an idea what are the ones which are very active and the other ones which are not very active. So for instance here, we have considered that if the value we measure is over 50 millinewton per meter, they are not uh, biosurfactant, okay? If they are in this uh, range, uh, they can be surfactants, but they are also in the range of uh, ULIS, for instance, macromolecules which are in the clouds. But if they are in that range, it is so active that in that case, we are pretty sure they are biosurfactants. And now if we look at the, who is producing these um, biosurfactants, and again, what you can see, there are mainly gamma proteobacteria. So the bacteria that are mainly pseudomonas and which are from the philosphere. So these bacteria, they seem to be very important because we find them they are the most abundant and they are the most active when they produce surfactant. Okay, now we try to see, the, the depending on the air masses, uh, is there an impact on the formation of this uh, biosurfactant production? So we have his, here the back trajectories of the different samples. But what we do in the lab is not, usually we don't take too much into account the back trajectories. We, we measure the composition of the, the cloud. Uh, so the different ion and cation and pH and uh, oxidant uh, power and so on. And we uh, then classify them depending on if they are polluted, continental, marine, or highly marine. So the main difference is by the pH, like you can see, here, pollutant is uh, more acidic. You also the sulfate, nitrate, and, and ammonia, which is much higher in polluted ones. Of course, if you look at highly marine, you will find a lot of uh, sodium, for instance. Okay, so this is the way we classify because it's much more accurate than just the the back trajectory because sometimes they go from the ocean and then they go on the earth and then they go back and they are a mix of the different uh, things. So um, what we have seen here, we have classified depending on the different uh, origin of the, the clouds. And here uh, you can see the, the, this plot. You can see the values of the minimum values of the surface tension. So they are almost all in the same range, but one is quite different, it is this one. Okay. Ah, oh, man, I did something wrong. What should I do now? What? Stop it, I think. No, it's yeah. coming back. Okay. So this one is quite different and comes from the highly marine compounds. And it's really the one that really go over the ocean. We have the maximum of sodium and so on. They are really impacted by the ocean. And if you look at the cells which are present in this marine uh, highly marine composition. If you look at this orange stuff, orange stuff are gamma proteobacteria. If you remember, these gamma proteobacteria, they are the ones which are very, very active. Mm -hmm. And of course here, they are in a very little number, which is quite logical because they come from the, the surface of the leaves. And this comes from the ocean, so it's normal that there is almost no proteobacteria. Yes. And because of that, you can see a great impact so we have a suggestion here that maybe uh, the philosphere could be important, an important factor for the production of biosurfactant and then a potential impact on this uh, formation of droplets. So that's the work we are doing now. Now we, we are looking for this biosurfactant directly in the, the, the aerosols using mass spectrometry. 
and we hope we're going to publish that soon. Okay, so our second aspect of microphysics, and this is well known from Louis, for instance, because he knows as much as I do, is the role, potential role of some microorganisms on the formation of ice nuclei. And this is related to some organisms, so not all the microorganisms have this potential. If you look at bacteria, for instance, they are again bacteria from the philosphere. And they are going to form ice as a rather high temperature, I mean less than minus 10 degrees, and you will see later they can start at minus 2 degrees, which is really high if you compare to other ice nuclei, that dust, for instance, that will start at minus 15, for instance. And these bacteria, they are from the philosphere, and again, they are belonging mainly to the pseudonas group, genera. And these bacteria actually were well known in the past because they are plant pathogens. So they were known for the pathologies of plants. Why? Because they are, some of them are pathogens because they are producing some toxins. And in addition of that, not only the toxin, but they make the plants freeze at a temperature where none, normally it doesn't freeze. So the plant, I always give this example, you take a salad, you put it in the fridge, when it's too cold, the salad becomes too floppy. So it's much easier for bacteria to enter and cross the, the cell wall, which is a cellulose, because a, a plant cell is quite uh, difficult to, to penetrate. So they make freeze, so they, they, they become very floppy, and then they inject the toxin, and then they, they kill the cell. So it's very good. Okay, so it was not in the past. What was known, it was really the process, and uh, it has been discovered that it is a membrane protein. Oh, no, no. Sorry about my manipulation of the... It's a membrane protein, so it's the out cell membrane because they are negative, they are gram negative, so they have two cell membranes. One is outside, and these uh, proteins are exposed to the outside, okay? And they are rather small ones, uh, com considering there are lots of proteins, they are not too big, that they can be arranged in clusters. So they are different clusters, and depending on these clusters, they can be more or less efficient. We know it is only a physical uh, process because it works also with dead cells. For instance, you take some of these pseudomonas syringe, we freeze dry them, we break them until the, the membrane protein is, uh, is still there. Of course, you don't have to destroy the membrane protein, but if it is still there, even the cell is dead, then you still have this activity. Since then, we have, it has been shown also there are some other biological molecules, big molecules which are containing sugars and different things. They can also induce this process. So it's due to the protein, it's not due to the, the metabolism of the cell, except that they have to produce the cell. They are not having this cell all the time. They produce them under stress, for instance, under cold condition. And uh, if they are starving, if there's not enough phosphorus and things like that. In that case, they produce it. So it's a physical problem. Then if you look uh, in a more, uh, uh, you focus on this protein. So the structure has been shown. So this is the molecular structure of the, of the protein. So it's a barrel, okay? And uh, in fact, it acts as a dimer. To be active, you need two, two of these barrels and they are linked here through this, uh, through this uh, they are interacting through these amino acids. And here it's a view of a modeling. What happens if you have add water molecule to this protein? In a few nanoseconds, what happens is all the molecules of, of water, which are these red dots here, they align along these molecules because there are some specific sites which are organized in such a way that the structure, the length here, if you look at the atoms, they are exactly the same as what is in the crystal molecule. So it's a perfect template to induce the crystallization. This is why it is so efficient, much more efficient than a dust, for instance. Okay, so when you have this structure, they can produce very, very quickly this ice at the surface of the, of the cells. Okay, so when we started this work, we knew that these bacteria were present on the philosphere, we knew that they could be present in snow and in rain, but nobody screened uh, bacteria for that. 
So we did screening uh, in the lab. Uh, we started fr from the isolate. So at that time we had this number of cells. Now we've done much more, but it was in 1930, 12, yeah. Um, so we make a freezing test, which is very easy. You dilute your number of cells, so you know how many cells you have per tube. And then you put it in a water bath and you decrease the temperature for minus three, minus two, minus two, minus three, minus four, etc. And you look how it freezes. So now in the lab we have a camera that makes it automatically, but you can do it by hand, it's the same result anyway. So then you have this type of, of curve where you have here what temperature it starts. So I, I tell you, it can be very active, even at minus three. And then we have the number of isonuclei per cell. So you, you may have is here you have the example of three different bacteria. They start at the same temperature, but then if you look at the number of ice nuclei they form, there are two orders of magnitude. So these two numbers are important, the temperature and the number of nuclei, of course. So this one is extremely active, and uh, I think it's, at the moment, I think it's the most active that has been ever described, this pseudonas uh, that we isolated in clouds. So now we wanted to see, okay, this is from the lab. We have isolated cells, but is it the true in the cloud? So what we have done in that case, we have uh, collected cloud samples, <coughs> 12 cloud samples all along the year. With the, these are the back trajectories. And the idea was, okay, we have a protein. If this protein is active, it means uh, uh, if we heat it at 90 degrees, you are going to destroy the protein. You are going to dis destroy the, the free day structure. So it will not be active. So what you do, you take your sample, you divide it in two parts. One is warm at 90 degrees, and the other one is not warm. So the one which is not known will give you the total number of, uh, of ice nuclei. It can be particles, it can be anything which is in the cloud, but it is the total number. The other one, you will have, in fact, by uh, making the difference, you have the biological number of clouds. So we don't know if it is bacteria, but we know it is biological and due to the protein which has been destroyed. And then we have measured that, and the conclusion is that 90% of these uh, biological uh, uh, compounds are ice nuclei in the cloud. As you can see here, even at minus 13. Of course, here it starts with non biological because you have a lot of dust. And if you were at minus 20, for instance, you have many dust. But in this area, they are due to these biological uh, components. OK. So the same result was obtained in rain and snow because there are many people working on other compounds. Now we wanted to, to work uh, in. Uh, in a chamber to try to create this cloud in a, a real cloud. It's not a real cloud, but at least you have a cloud <laughs> with droplets and it is, <laughs> it is still artificial. So in Europe, you have this uh, facility uh, in Karlsruhe and it's uh, managed by Ot Otmar Muller. Some of you know him. And so we, we made a campaign there where we injected uh, this bacteria in the, the cloud chamber and in particular this uh, pseudomonas strain, which was so active. So uh, it works, it is a huge building, as you've seen on the picture, and there is a, a big chamber, it is quite large, 84 meters, mm -hmm. and you can inject here by a nozzle a bacterial suspension. You can control the AOH, um, which is 95%, and you can control the temperature and go down to minus 20 degrees, then you can have a lot of instruments looking at that. And then you can make a big vacuum and control the, the temperature, and then basically uh, you are going to create a cloud. And so for people, uh, sorry for people who are really on, on this field, but for the others, what you can see here, so it's one of the things you can see, there are many instruments, but one of the things you can see is the diameter of the particle which are formed. So when they are here, and, and that, uh, so that's microns, okay, in the range of 10 microns, you have the formation of uh, droplets. If you are over here, you have formation of ice crystal. Of course, this is also due to other measurements that confirm it is ice, uh, not only the diameter. And so what you do, you, you are doing this, uh, this uh, decrease in pressure. So we inject the, the cell, we decrease the pressure, and then the clouds form. And what you can see clearly is that, of course, you form uh, droplets 
and you form also ice crystals. So it's a dem demonstration that indeed you are forming ice crystal using these bacteria. So they are, because they are only one which are injected, there's no other particles. So we played a, a lot with that, but I'm not presenting the result. So it was also the proof that they can act as ice nuclei in under conditions which are closer to, to cloud formation. Okay, so uh, the conclusion of, of this talk is the first is about cloud chemistry. So we have shown that they may play a role in the biotransformation of organic matter, of carbon compounds. They are interacting with oxidants and they can play a direct or indirect role. And from cloud microphysics, they can maybe play a role in the cloud droplet formation as biosurfactants or in precipitation between ice crystals. Of course, all these remain hypotheses. Now we have moved to more and more experiments because there are not so many people working on that topic, so we don't have enough data. And we stop now to go to modeling, especially for organic matter. Now we have a, a project for a four years project with the call of uh, our president who made a call that was called Make Our Planet Great Again to face the politics of Trump. So we have invited uh, foreigners to come in the lab. And so there were some uh, few elected people and one of them was is, uh, is from coming from NOAA and has been in the lab now for four years to model all this. And finally, uh, for people who are not from the atmospheric sun, why is it important to, to look at clouds and what is important in clouds on the climate? So this is a kind of view uh, about what is the impact of the solar radiation on one hand, what is the, 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 the role here of the, the clouds in the green as compared to the, the different effects. As you know, clouds may have a double effect. They can stop the radiation, so in a way, they can cool the thing, but they can also stop the radiation in the other way, so they can be also a kind of green gas uh, effect. But if we look globally at what happens, clouds are rather cooling than warming. So cooling is the most important effect of clouds. But again, uh, we don't know much about the impact of these clouds because many people know that. It has been uh, published many times. If you look at the different factors that will make uh, a change on the climate and uh, especially on the increase of temperature. Some are very well known, you know that CO2, methane and so on. They are increasing for sure the temperature. These are rather increasing or decreasing. But clouds here and aerosol, there is still a question mark. Even <laughs> if we know it is decreasing, uh, cooling, I mean, there is a, such an error bar here, large in uncertainty which is due that to the fact that we don't know too much what happens in clouds and what is interaction between clouds and aerosol. And this uncertainty is so high, it is the major uncertainty to uh, predict the climate change. So of course, we know, all of us, we know that it will going to be warmer, but how much? Two degrees, four degrees? That's the, the, the important thing. And this, for the moment, is not solved because clouds are so complicated to understand that uh, there are still a lot of uncertainties. Of course, because I'm working on biology, we say now it's time to integrate microbes also in atmospheric chemistry but, and models, including with the ice nucleation as well. Okay, and uh, now it's time for the conclusion to thank all the people who were involved in this work. So um, Pierre Amato, who is a main researcher in the group, uh, Martin Sancel, uh, who is a uh, really uh, in charge of uh, the microbiology service and all the maintenance of all the microbes and so on. Virginie, who is uh, Vinatier, who is more a chemist, she worked a lot on these uh, oxidants. Isabelle Canet and Monir Traika are experts in uh, mass spectrometry and NMR because we use a lot of these tools. I didn't present that, but it is part of our things. Mm -hmm. Pascal Renard, a postdoc, who worked on these biosurfactants. Elona a postdoc working on these things in uh, Karlsruhe. Michael worked a lot on the, the, the transformation of uh, organic compounds in the clouds. Muriel, Julie worked on ice nucleation. And Norwen Virgo, the latest one, worked a lot on the interaction between uh, hydrogen peroxide and the metabolism of the cloud. And of course, we, uh, we are all in the same lab in this Institute of Chemistry, but we work in very strong collaboration with Laurent de Guillaume, who is in charge of the Puy de station concerning clouds. And he's also very good at uh, atmospheric chemistry, so we couldn't work without him. 
And we have to thank, of course, our institution mm -hmm. like uh, the CNRS, because I'm a CNRS researcher, the university where I work, and uh, the funding from the ANR, the ministry, and the regional council. And to finish, I will thank you for your attention. So I hope it was not too focused because I didn't know about the assembly. I have heard just yesterday, but they, it's very diverse. There are people very focused on atmospheric chemistry, others not at all. So maybe I'm, uh, I would like to apologize for people who maybe uh, couldn't follow everything because well, I, I didn't know about the, the audience. So. Thank you, uh, Professor Anne-Marie Delors. Hay algunas preguntas? Um, hello. Um, first, thank you for coming here to give us uh, this e excellent presentation. I hope you like our university. And um, well, I have a couple of questions. Um, in the from the part of chemistry, uh, it wasn't clear for me what is the origin of the H T H two O two in the cloud. The origin. Okay. And for the microphysics part, um, I don't know if you can repeat, like, what is the philosphere? Okay, I said so. The first one is easier. Philosphere is just a name of the place where microbes, philo, is vegetation in Greek. And philosphere is where habitants are on this sphere, so on these leaves. Okay? So it's just, why well, I could say surface of the vegetation, it would mean exactly the same. So it's a location on the phyllos, so on the, on the plants. For the origin of hydrogen peroxide, there are different ones. Uh, there are, uh, first of all, a transfer from the gas phase to the, to the, to the liquid phase, because it's produced in the gas phase. It's a, an important source of the uh, hydrogen peroxide. The other one, is, uh, is due to the presence of iron, of sulfate, of different reactants that are uh, reacting and giving this H2O2. So they are both origin. One is produced directly in cloud water, but one big part is produced from the, the gas phase and is transferred in the, in the liquid phase. Okay, thank you. And, and rather, it can also be transferred from the liquid phase to the gas phase. But the main flux is from the, the gas phase. And you can see it from the models. When you see the modeling, uh, the, the flux from HO2 is very, very important. So it's higher than the production intact. One is chemical and one is physical. They are both chemical, but it's produced first in the, because many compounds are produced in the atmosphere, in the gas phase first, before being transferred in the, in the water phase. Okay. Thank but H2O2 uh, is transferred very easily, so it just transferred to there. Thank you. And I didn't say in too many things, but the concentration in the, the water phase is around from 10 to 100 micromolar, if you need a range of order. Thank you. Más preguntas? So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. So you have, you show us that you have a very great database of microorganisms that has been isolated for mid-latitude clouds. Mm. So we are here in the tropics. So would you expect that we have here a completely different population of microorganisms that can behave completely different to what you have found in Europe or in mid-latitudes? Or are they going to be similar? So I don't know too much because of the, of the cloud, because there are not many data. There are, we have data from La Réunion, which is a small island close to Madagascar that belongs to France. We only did two campaigns. So there are some bacteria which are completely different, the other are quite similar. Now if we look at what has been published in the air, because now there are a few papers that are came out from the air, uh, there are differences, of course, dif depending, for instance, on the influence of, the, which is important, for instance, in the, the import of the, the dust from Sahara, for instance, or from Chinese uh, deserts, that they can carry different types of cells. What is important is really the, if we are really close to the ocean. For instance, in Japanese, they have published some papers, they have samples really um, 
the, the sampling site is close to the sea, then they have, uh, they have different type of bacteria. Also, what is not so clear from the literature, because there are not enough data, um, is in our case, we sample clouds which are in the free troposphere. So they are not normally influenced from the, the, the ground. But of course, they are influenced by the region. They are still in Europe, uh, for sure. But many people, they sample close to the ground. So in that case, you don't know if it is, well, it can be uh, even more local, more, you know, so there is still. I think they are, what is published is, my, in all cases, the proteobacteria, for some reason, are always very present. But for instance, we have Firmicutes, which are, in case are not so big, and in other cases, they have a lot. Uh, actinobacteria, we have quite, quite a lot, some are less than that. The same for from our metagenomics data, we have the presence of uh, cyanobacteria and algae. In, clear, in, in our water, in our place, uh, they are not so important. Although, for instance, people who have uh, sampled close to the sea, like the Japanese, they have quite a lot. So I think, I think they are more or less the same, but they can be in under different proportions. But I think we don't, I cannot answer clearly because we don't have enough data. Thank you for an interesting talk. And what a surprise for me to look at the metabolism of the bacteria similar to the phylosphere bacteria. <laughs> yeah. Because we are working with the phylosphere bacteria oh, and the formaldehyde and all the, uh, uh, and the stress, the, mm -hmm. uh, the oxidative stress is incredible in, in the clouds. What a surprise for me. I, I think, um, I often, uh, I think, well, that's just um, my personal opinion, so it has no proof at all, but I think it's not uh, just a, a chance that these bacteria are the main one in the clouds and they are uh, reacting, uh, facing this uh, oxidative stress and light and so on. Because when you think more closely, you look at the leaf and you see the bacteria on the leaf. They are exposed to the air, they are exposed to the light, they are exposed to oxidant. So they are the, the, the ones which are really ready to, to cope with this compared to bacteria, because initially we thought we had more from the ocean, for instance. But in the ocean, except the very, they are mixed up, they are, they are not exposed in the same way to the, to the conditions that looks like, also the change in temperature. Because the thing I didn't uh, expose because I didn't have time, but one of the things which is amazing about clouds and microorganisms is the fact it's not only an extreme place because it's cold, it's uh, oxidative. Okay, they can cope with that. It's because it's changing all the time, you know? A cloud, it can be at 15 degrees and maybe uh, 10 minutes after it would be at minus uh, 10 degrees and go down. And, and also a leaf, in a way, it's exposed to day and light, to cold. And uh, here in, in Mexico, I've seen that in the, during the day, during the night, you may have big change. And so I think they are the most, first, it's easier for them to go in the air because they, they, they dry on the surface, make uh, the biofilm is, is uh, drying, and then the, the wind takes them in the sky and also the rain. When you see a big storm falling on the, on the leaf, uh, when you imagine the size of a microbe, which is one micron and a, a big storm, then they are jumping out. It has been filmed that. There was a, a science uh, this year. When it drops, it goes up. So they are easier going in the, in the atmosphere. And they are, in my opinion, prepared to this, uh, this life because they are the closest um, atmosphere. Also concerning the, the C1 metabolism. As you know, they can form methanol, they can form chloromethane, they can form any, lots of compounds that can be found in, in, uh, in the atmosphere as well. So they are also prepared a lot to, to be active on C1 metabolism, for instance. Even chloromethane, for instance. We, we had a, a project about chloromethane there. Plants are emitting chloromethane and bacteria on the surface are degrading chloromethane. Which is I, am, I am right if I talk about the microorganisms in the cloud treat the water, treat the because you, you can you can you can say that in a way yeah for instance we we are well, the paper is under review at the moment but we have worked uh, recently on on uh, aromatic compounds on phenol 
to have worked on the bacteria and the, the degradation of phenol and the clouds. So we have shown by metatransliponic and also by looking now isolate how they can degrade uh, phenol and they degrade it as efficiently as uh, uh, which radicals and so so we say maybe they can depollute but well yeah if they participate to the change on the the, the pollutant for sure yeah? hi i see you <laughs> <laughs> nice talk thank you i think this um a very relevant topic. It's very important, but we are not like science. So um, the bacteria act like um, as CCN, right? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, they consume the organic matter already there. Yeah, yes, of course. So in, in gas phase, introduced directly to the liquid phase mm -hmm. and transfer probably to new particles mm -hmm. because they the, low, the pressure goes down and just form a new organic matter so but also the bacteria produce the own uh, organics right of course of course this is one of the topics also yes, can be exactly assessed, yeah. so um it's a very interesting uh, to know if uh, um, there are uh, there is uh, some competition between the secondary organic also already emitted by the for example biomass burning mm -hmm and the uh, bacteria to form the CCN or some kind of a synergistic effects are between them and just to create more CCNs and to form the clouds. So what do you think? Uh, of, course, of course it could be. Uh, the only thing we did, uh, it was, was just one paper we have made on that topic, it was looking at the transformation of sugars, for instance. And they were forming EPS, so big molecules of uh, long molecules of sugars and there as you know that EPS have been formed also from phytoplankton in the ocean it has been shown they were sources of uh, secondary aerosols but um, well it's just one one paper we made and we, but in principle of course for instance what we have uh, in another paper we have done I didn't present that but we worked on this problem of complexation of iron which is still unknown in the clouds everybody takes oxalate as a proxy of complexation, but we know it, it doesn't work. It should be some bigger molecules. And we have proposed that maybe CDO4 could, could be produced. There are molecules which are rather big produced by the bacteria to catch, the, the to complex the iron, which is, again, the, the order of magnitude is about two orders complex to oxalate. And now we have seen from metatranscriptonic that there are really CDO4 which are expressed in there. Now we should look for them again, but again, they are big molecules. They could act also as, a, as CCN when it is evaporated. There are many things they could do. Of course, we, we didn't explore that, but it is a, there is a potential. Always I say a potential because we don't know, but of course it, it, it is a possibility. Because in that, of course, we, we examine rather the oxidation, but not the oligomerization step, but it could be, I don't know. It will take 20 years to answer, I think. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you very much for the exciting talk. Um, I agree with Irma. Uh, one of the things that you showed about the stress and how the, um, the reactivity or the ATP mm -hmm. things um, in, the, in, the cla in the bacteria are mm -hmm. reduced. Coping, mm. as I know, and coping with mm. that. So um, I would like to, if you could um, talk a little bit more about the polluted situation where, where the concentrations of the stressors mm. are higher. Um, you mentioned that, that, you, that your measurements were made mostly pududom and, mm. and, and uh, specifically urban or industrial pollution, but I'm interested in, in, in your thoughts about the biomass burning um, and the fact that even though the proteins are killed, then the biosurfactant aspect may still be active and how would that play uh, mm. in in polluted situations okay. so we we, di we didn't do that but what we did uh, using selected strains and uh, not on clouds completely on clouds but on strains on different we we took five different strains and we exposed them to extreme conditions that are present in clouds for instance, uh, concerning uh, hydrogen peroxide, we went up to uh, millimolar 
of hydrogen peroxide. And until one millimolar, they were still uh, coping with that. Okay. Uh, we, we went to, to, we made also osmotic stress because we know that when the, there's evaporation, in a way, you are going to concentrate the things. So we played with concentration of uh, um, sodium chloride as a proxy of the, of the ions. And that, in that case, some of them were fine, some were not so fine. So if you increase too much the concentration, they may not resist to this stress. And then we also went to a very bad, very strong stress. We put them at minus 20 degrees and make cycles, six cycles after that, okay? And they are still resisting. Many of them resist all that. But it, of course, it's a very strong stress, which is uh, quite... Uh, They're alive, you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you can have that kind of cycle in convective clouds okay, because this is you, they, didn't, you don't have much convective they, clouds. Uh, this is, okay, there. okay. And also, uh, to, to conclude what you say, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that activity will not be the same in all the conditions. I mean, there will be clouds where, first of all, if they are liquid clouds, it's much easier. If they are frozen clouds, Anyway, chemistry is not also fantastic when <laughs> it is frozen. But okay, they can survive, but they are not active. Or they are active because it has been shown they can be in ca active in, in ice, but the rates will be so slow that it has not uh, great importance, I think. Uh, of course, pollution, I don't know. They can, I think they can cope a lot with pollution because if you look what happens on the, on the Earth, uh, we are working with phenol, for instance. So if you have places where it is highly polluted, they can still cope with that. But maybe the, the rate of degradation, if you go to depollution, no, it, may, it won't be uh, important because the time is too short. Okay. But I think they can resist to a lot of stress, but then the rate of degradation of the compound can be very dependent on the, uh, on the context and can be more or less competitive compared to, to... But the same for chemistry, because now everybody wonders what happens really in chemistry. What is really at the interface? Because all the, 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 the models, they take the Henry Law to, to model to do the transfer, and now we say, oh, maybe there are a lot of compounds, uh, organic compounds at the surface, how it changed the reactivity, what are really happening? So there will be still a lot of questions. But I agree with you that there are some extreme events where maybe they can behave differently. But for hydrogen peroxide, it's, they are really, it's, it, hydrogen peroxide and light, light in the cloud, because in the cloud, as you know, you don't have the 250, okay, we are not in the <laughs> high stratosphere. This they don't mind too much. They, they, they are more demanding about the, the salt stress and the uh, freezing and defreezing. It's not freezing, but freezing, defreezing, freezing, this <laughs> cycles. Yeah. Mm. There is a question by internet oh, really? from, <laughs> from Klaus, and the question is, if climate change could affect bacteria and clothes, and if yes, how it affects to marine ecosystem? Well, this I'm not going to answer. <laughs> For instance, well, a very partial uh, answer. So the, the one is, the first one is a bit linked to what you said about the, the chemicals which are here, are they going to be affected? I think they can resist to many things. Maybe the, the rates of degradation will be slower, so they are not so efficient in doing things. But in a way, it's the same with OH radical. If you increase the concentration, then the rates will decrease also. So maybe it will be the same. Then for ice, ice uh, nucleation, uh, when we were in Kashui, we did experiment where we injected the, 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 the how you say, the bacteria and also uh, sulfate ammonia to make uh, covering the, the cells. And then uh, you could see that they are not so efficient in making the, the, the ice, okay? Because the, it will change the structure of the protein and so it's not so efficient. So it can be an indication of pollution. We have made experiments varying the, the ozone concentration that has no effect, NO concentration that has no effect, uh, but pH has an effect. So if you have an um, acidic pH, then the ice nucleation is decreased. So it could be related for polluted clouds are much more acidic. And we have found the same thing in, in, uh, in rain water. I didn't present, but we work also on rain. And rain, we have made a survey with uh, 16 different, no, no more than that, but 50 different rain samples, and it, there was a correlation with pH decrease. So 
uh, on that it can be it can be effective yeah but then I don't know for the rest because I have no idea thanks My question is a little bit similar to the previous one that you answered on the concentration. Um, since your database is 10 years, I understand, and then you've caught at the Clermont station the Eiffel La Yokel eruption. Hmm. What concentra What did that have any effect on, especially the iron? You mean what? On the, uh, can you uh, repeat? Yes. I didn't completely yes. Understand. With your on your at your observatory. Yeah you had the plume from that eruption and because it went partly to France and to different parts of England. I know it went by there, so you mm. should have seen it. Yeah, so peop people in, the, in the Clermont in the observatory, they yes. made, uh, okay, they, they, um, they monitored that yes. in the air, but we didn't in the cloud. Okay. Because we, you need to be there at the right time, you need to have clouds. They don't have to be no rain, no no snow. It has to be there. It has to last enough. So unfortunately, we don't have any. So people working in the air, okay, they they have monitored that and they have seen the influence, especially from uh, Iceland uh, eruption. It was a, a big event that they could follow. Unfortunately, in in our case, we didn't have anything. In your Union? At La Réunion, we we have, but there was no eruption at that time. So. We are, you have to consider one thing, maybe I didn't insist on that. When you take a cloud sample, you have to be there, you have to collect it, then you have to analyze it, so basically it's more than one month's, one month's work. Okay, It's not a monitoring online monitoring like the rest, so we miss a lot of things, because you, even if Clermont is not far, it's a half an hour driving to go to the bottom of the Puy Dome, and then you have a, a small train to go if you want. You need at least two people, then you have everything to be ready, then you have to, the cloud to be there and uh, to last enough time to collect it, and it has not been during the weekend, because the weekend maybe the technician is not there, so then uh, maybe it's holiday and uh, the student is on holiday, and uh, you know what I mean, and uh, oh, it's, it's okay, and then it vanishes or it begins to rain, so you cannot collect it, so in the end we have um, more or less one event per month at the maximum that you can collect, so so this is why we, we missed some important events that it was, well, it was a shame. So La Réunion, maybe we have more because we have a new contract starting uh, from October for four years. It will be based at La Réunion. So maybe we have more. But again, it will be in campaigns. It will be not all the time. We have to move there and to collect. So if it is not the, the right period, but we have more information, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it is another topic we never looked at, but Interaction with uh, volcanic uh, things would be very interesting, but we cannot. We are a small team, so <laughs> unfortunately, we don't cover it. But it's a good. Uh, I think it would be a very interesting topic. Do you know what, what is the effect of uh, electric activity or thunderstorms okay. uh, on the processes? So somebody in France uh, looked at that, Cindy Morris actually, and they, they well, it, it didn't work. But they, they tried to make experiments on ground uh, producing lightning mm -hmm. and to see if there would be a DNA transfer. Because if you are, I don't know if you're a biologist, no. When you are biology, if you do genetics and you want to transfer gene from one cell to the other, you have to do something with the membrane because <laughs> it will not go through. So basically, you, you, you make an electric charge, difference of potential, to, to make holes. Well, it's not exactly holes, holes in the membrane, and so you can, the DNA can get in. So this is the way you can do cloning, for instance. So the idea was the same, saying, well, if you produce lightning, then you, ch you may change the, the membrane and then you have transfer of DNA. So the problem is, I think, is uh, it, it can be true um, on the soil. So for instance, when they, f they go in the soil and you have a thunder, a thunder light, because on soil, bacteria are very close one to the other. You know, we have 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 cells per gram of soil. So they are so close because for the transfer you have to be really close because they, <laughs> the DNA or the way will go in uh, somewhere else. So in the clouds it was a good idea I think but 
it, it is not, um, I think it's not feasible. It's not feasible because you know there will be, the droplets are too far one to the other for the DNA to go and enter another. But of course, uh, it's just, uh, we don't know the hypothesis, but okay, they, they thought about the idea, but uh, okay, they, they will have. Another possibility, we don't know, uh, the studies are, are, are stopped, they didn't follow, but uh, the idea is maybe when they go in the atmosphere because of that, with all the stresses they have, the radicals, this uh, lightning, maybe it will help to, to produce mutation on the DNA, and then later on, on the membrane, or it will change something that we cannot visualize, but in the future, when they are back, to the soil, or it could be to the ocean to answer to the other guy, then maybe you, you are going to change the nature of the, of, the, um, of the ecosystem because it's not something natural to have traveled in the atmosphere. That's also a, a great idea, but how to prove it? That it, it can be the case that you, you change, uh, they, they, when they go to a thunderstorm, then they are back, if they are still alive, they are different. Something has been changed maybe. Más preguntas. Bueno, thank you very much, doctor. And I uh, thank you again for invitation, especially to Luis. Thank you. Thank you very much.